Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we have concluded with Isaiah's Christmas sermon and are moving on to the threat of Sennacherib under the days of Hezekiah. Greg, would you take on your usual role of telling us the story? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, before we uh, before we went live, David, our producer, asked the question or made the observation. We we were just back in in Isaiah nine, and suddenly we're with Sennacherib, and what's that all about? Actually, not a whole lot of time has passed. The Christmas sermon that Isaiah delivered to Ahaz was someplace in the middle of his rule, and he did not reign that very long. And his son. Hezekiah comes to the throne upon his desk, and Isaiah immediately begins setting things right. His first act, actually, is to open up the temple. Ahaz had shut it. And to repair the temple. Ahaz had made a mess of it. Uh, and to throw a Passover, like Israel had not seen in forever. And so he's beginning these reforms, <clears throat> and along the way, one of his reforms is to break the covenant that Ahaz had established with Assyria. Hmm. Apparently, he was moving a little fast on God's table. You know, just because you turn to Christ and try to fix everything doesn't mean that all of your problems immediately go away. <clears throat> like a oh, huge empire with this huge army that's, you know, within striking distance. So he seems to have miscalculated there. And so the reigning emperor, whose name is Sennacherib, turns his armies toward Judah, toward Jerusalem. And Hezekiah says, oh, whoops, sorry, don't know what I was thinking, lose my head next. Um, (laughs) Yeah, you can go back, I'll pay whatever you say. But it was a little late. (sighs) Sennacherib felt that he needed to make an example or some such thing. Besides, he wanted to expand toward Egypt in any case, so it it was inevitable, something was going to happen. And if Hezekiah wasn't going to side with Assyria, sooner or later this was going to come. And the army arrives in Judea, and Sennacherib begins subduing all of the other cities, saving Jerusalem for last. We have uh, an ancient uh, inscription from the ruins of Nineveh from this time period where Sennacherib is boasting. He says, Hezekiah himself, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. One commentator said, I guess that's a fancy cocky way of saying he couldn't take the city, which is about what it it amounts to. Yes, in the end- (laughs) That's a spin. That's what we call it. In in the game of news, we call that spinning. Yes, we call that spinning. And so, um, yeah, there was uh, a part of the army. Most of the army was elsewhere doing other things, but a part of the army showed up with Sennacherib's, well, one of his right-hand men, a guy named Rabshaka to intimidate Hezekiah, to intimidate the Jews in Jerusalem, and to say in so many words, you are so toast. Why don't you just open your gates right now, (laughs) cut a deal with us, and um, just wait for us. And when we have a moment, we'll send horses and and take whoever can ride them, and we'll take them, we'll take you all the way to a nice, safe place. And what we have beginning in Isaiah, Isaiah 36 is that interaction or confrontation. Hezekiah doesn't go out to meet this envoy. He sends his own envoys, just as Sennacherib doesn't come in his own person. But the envoys meet, and this Rabshakeh, which is a title, has been primed and prepped to know exactly what to say. And so with that in mind, I would like to read some of this and make some comments along the way. So again, this is Isaiah 36. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. So Lachish was at that point Sennacherib's personal concern. He's there with the bulk of his army. Uh, Lachish was a a city that, that was associated with Judah, but it kind of made a break from the from some of the raunchier kings. So Sennacherib's dealing with that, but he sends Rabshakeh with a good sizable army. 
and we're told, and he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Now, if we remember back to the beginning of the Christmas sermon, that's exactly where Isaiah confronted Ahaz and ended up making the promise of the virgin birth of Messiah. Hmm. It's it's a, a very symbolic place in that it's a place where things are made white as snow and where the waters that feed Jerusalem empty themselves out. So there's there's typology going on here, and here stands, uh, this time though, the pagan king, and he has demands to make, but uh, Hezekiah's men come out to meet him. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. So members of, of Hezekiah's cabinet, basically. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now unto Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trusteth? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war now, and whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereupon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all that trusted him. Okay, first argument. What do you think you're doing? We have, um, you don't have a Hulk, and we do have an army, and it's unstoppable, and no one has ever stood up to us. You don't have the power. Well, oh, I know. You're thinking political alliance. You probably have some kind of deal with, with Egypt. Don't do that. Egypt never never honors its bargains. They, they got nothing. It's like leaning on a reed, a uh, sharp, pointy stick. Your hand, will, it'll go right through your hand, and you'll be worse than before. So don't even, don't even trust that. Next argument. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and said to <laughs> Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Okay, next argument. And see, he's, he's got, obviously has spies in the city because he knows what's going on, but they're apparently not Jewish spies because the <laughs> Jews would, would have explained it differently. All he knows is that Hezekiah, upon coming to the throne, had gotten rid of all of the multitude of of pagan altars that had filled Jerusalem. Uh, and what Sennacherib takes away from this is, well, he's taking away from the people their right to worship freely. He's attacking freedom of religion. He's he And, and he's insulting God or the gods because he's, he's destroying their altars. So, yeah, don't, don't even think that the God will help you because look at what Hezekiah... Now, of course, Hezekiah was doing exactly what God wanted him to do by getting rid of all of this idolatrous worship. But Sennacherib didn't understand that, so th this was just a complete misfire. That doesn't go anywhere. But now he moves to his offer. Now, therefore, give pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. You got 2,000 people in that little city of yours? I don't think so. And how wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Not only do you not have the military hardware, you don't have the population. You can't even support or field an army. So what? Back to e Egypt? No, we, we, we've already been there. And, <clears throat> plays a different card, am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. That's a closer hit, because as far as Judah could reckon things, that could be true. Maybe God had sent them as judgment. In fact, Isaiah had said things like that. <laughs> and so that's a little touchy. That's a, oh, sore spot. Uh, what if he What if he really knows something here? What if God has sent him? What if God has abandoned this already? So question, uh, yeah. is this before or after um, the prophet of the Lord who said this false altar is going to be torn down and desecrated. And then he was leaving. And then somebody else who was a servant of the Lord said, come eat with me. But the okay. Lord had told him not to eat with him. Yeah. You're remembering um, the things concerning the the golden calf and its altar, which are mm. the first. So okay. So this would be. Because, yeah. Okay. So we should be remembering that at this point where someone claims to have a commandment from God. <sighs> Well, the thing is, but then in the case you decided he didn't, he just claimed he did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, something, that, something that will will become relevant, far more relevant, in Josiah's reign, and Josiah comes later, when Josiah uh, 
begins military confrontation with Pharaoh Necho out of Egypt. Pharaoh Necho says, your God told me that you're to leave me alone. And he really had. He had really appeared to a pagan king and said, Josiah is to leave you alone and you're to leave him alone. Don't go there. And so the king says, okay, wasn't planning on it. And uh, I'll tell him if he shows up. And he did. And, but Josiah didn't listen. Probably saying, oh, well, he's just making that up. Remember Sennacherib. <laughs> so, yeah. Hmm. So it's, it, it, it does become a real thing. Is this, this pagan king is saying, God is on my side because you have been wicked. Which is true. Which is true. And it's the kind of thing God does. And God, and Isaiah had already spoken of Assyria coming up through the land um, and, and leveling it and taking everything. So, and, and then we go further. Then said Eliakim and Shebna and Joah unto Rebshekah, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, that is in Aramaic. For we understand it, and speak not to us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. Uh, could we shift to code, please? <laughs> what you're saying is, uh, <laughs> the implication is it's um, uh, discouraging mm -hmm. to the people on the wall who can hear you. So can we shift to your language, which would still a lot like Hebrew, but it, but spoken with their accent, with their vocabulary, probably would not be as understandable. And they could all speak it. I never but, really understood this request. Like I understand wanting to avoid the demoralizing effect of you know, your enemy's propaganda being shouted to you. you know, but did they really expect him to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was frightening <laughs> your people. Well, yeah, they did actually. <laughs> what? <laughs> God, people are, are, are naive sometimes. You know, whatever you do, don't do that. Oh, you mean this? <clears throat> oh, hey, Vladimir Putin, here's a list of all the things we would not like you to attack, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they, I mean, they didn't ex exactly, well, they did. I was going to say, they didn't exactly say why they didn't want him to talk in, 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 in Hebrew, but it's implied. So don't, we don't, so the people on the wall don't hear you. Well, that's kind of a giveaway. Why would they not want them to hear him? Because, and as I said, this guy has been prepped and primed to know exactly what to say. He's going through one argument after another. The one about Hezekiah rearranging worship he missed on because he was badly informed. But the rest are pretty, you know, they're, they're to the point. They're scary things. But Rabshakeh, when he hears this request, takes, takes it and runs with it. This is what he says. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Ooh, potty mouth. Yeah, that's, he's, he's, he's being really rude. And, you know, when you have the upper hand, sometimes cussing out your uh, naive and uh, seemingly defeated foe just makes it worse because you know you're not being treated as a gentleman, as an equal. You know that you're being roughed up and slapped in the ears and things are going downhill. And then Rabshakeh ex escalates. And then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith, and so he's going past the envoys to the people trying to stir up a direct democratic revolution within the walls. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Okay, so the next argument is, we can avoid war. No one has to die here today. Just send out some kind of token present, gold or silver or something like that, and uh, we'll take we'll take that. It's good enough for now, and we're going to go. We have other people to kill. We'll go do that. And but and, and while we're gone, just you you have the freedom. You can come out. You can go back to your little villages. Uh, go visit your own house. Sleep in your own bed. Drink of your own cistern. Eat your own from your own vineyard. And then we'll come back, and we will take you to a land. It's going to be just like your land. It's going to be a wonderful land, a land flowing with milk and honey and all that kind of thing. 
there's 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 no lose here. This this is all great. Just you know, work work with us here. And then he says this. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Oops. <laughs> that was the question you should not have asked. <laughs> That's the line you shouldn't have stepped over, because to this point, yes, God's people have sinned. They've been very wicked. The last king was an abomination, barely in his grave. And they would have every reason to expect that God might use the Assyrians as the rod of his chastisement. But now he stepped over and saying, you know, your God's not so great. Uh, we've defeated other gods later on. Uh, in a, I think it's in the letter. He will say, yeah, the other nations, they had better looking gods than you. They had better idols. You don't even have a decent idol here. What's with you? <laughs> <coughs> so You can't uh, even see him. Who yeah. is this guy? So, um, yeah, your your God just isn't going to measure up. Uh, we've defeated, uh, our gods have defeated, and remember, any time in the ancient world when nations went to war, it was assumed their gods went to war. And when one nation defeated the other, its gods defeated their gods. And so then you scooped up their idols and brought them to the temple of your gods, and they became subjects and servants and slaves to your gods. That's how you built pantheons. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the assumption here is our gods have beat up all the other gods. They'll beat up Jehovah. So they're, they're, no god has even give our gods a, a run for the money. It's just just give it up. And now it's personal. Now God's mm -hmm. own honor is at stake. It's not about his people and whether they've been sinful or not. It's whether or not God is really God. This little lesson in comparative religion was a horrible misstep, but Shekha does not know that yet. Well, Hezekiah's envoys were told they held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. So these guys go back and um, tell Hezekiah with their clothes rent that this is all he said. It looks really bad, boss. Um, what are we supposed to do? What's our next move? He's got this huge army. He's got more army coming. We don't have anything. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're telling us trust the Lord... Now would be a really great time for the Lord to do something. Maybe you should go do something about that. Chapter 37. And it came to pass when the king Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he said, Eliakim, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, unto Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. So two things are happening at once. Hezekiah has a two-pronged strategy here. He's going to go into the temple because Solomon said things like this. If you, if you need God, pray to the temple or pray toward the temple. And, but he's also going to go seek out, he's going to have his guys go and seek out Isaiah, who is the prophet of the hour right now. He's, he survived Ahaz's reign. He, he's still around. The message that Hezekiah sends to Isaiah is this. This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy for the children that come to birth and there's not strength to bring forth. It's like a lady being delivered of child, but she can't, she's lost the strength. She can't push, can't get the child to come out. So they're both going to die if something doesn't happen. That's how it felt in Jerusalem. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God. Now, he doesn't mean here in the sense of know of their existence. Obviously, God hears everything. He means perhaps God will take this as a serious enough matter that he will do something about it. You know, God doesn't respond every time somebody curses him or insults him or tries to make fun of him. If, if, we, if he did, the planet would be vastly depopulated. <laughs> so Hezekiah is hoping that this is a significant enough issue, given the time and circumstances, that God will decide this one doesn't get a free pass. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that's left. So, the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, 
And Isaiah already knows about this. God has already briefed him. He says, Thus shall you say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. He doesn't address all the other stuff that Rabshakeh said, because as we said, there was some truth in most of it. But blasphemy against God, comparing God to one of the minor pagan deities and say that they could beat up on him, uh, that was over the top. Thank you. <laughs> so God's going to deal with that. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. A blast upon him. It's kind of vague, but it doesn't, it doesn't sound good for the Assyrian army. And when and Sennacherib was going to be turned back and go home, back to Nineveh, and he's going to die there. Someone's going to run a sword through him. Not a lot of information, but neither does it need to be. God has just <laughs> said, got you covered. All the stuff you wanted, I'm, uh, I'm going to intervene. Uh, I'm going to send him packing, and when he gets home, someone's going to kill him. Anything else? Well, there is something else, because as Rabshakeh goes back to uh, check in with his king, verse 8, Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he had departed from Lachish. So this is another city that belonged properly to Judah, but in, in, at an earlier time had separated itself because of the wickedness of the kings. And so it's still standing, apparently. And so for some reason, the not told Sennacher goes to attack that. But, verse 9, and he heard say concerning Terhaka, king of Ethiopia, that is Ethiopia and Egypt, he has come forth to make war with thee. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah. So, first of all, there's this other city that's giving him some trouble. And when he's right in the middle of that, word comes the Ethiopians and Egyptians are coming. And you remember how lightly Rabshakeh had dismissed Egypt. <laughs> well, apparently it's not that easy. There's actually going to have to be a fight. They have a very large army, and they, whereas Syria may be able to knock them out, it's that's going to have to be played out on the field of battle. So they have more important things to do than worry about Jerusalem. But enough time to send a message to say, don't get your hopes, hopes up, Hezekiah. This is what he says. Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed as Gozan and Haran and Rezath and the children of Eden, which were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arphad, the king of the cities of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva? Okay, now it's gotten more personal. Don't let Hezekiah, don't let your God deceive you through Hezekiah and say that somehow he's going to magically fix this, like gods have that kind of power. <laughs> our, we've taken out, our gods have taken out every kingdom and their gods. And as I said, I, it's not apparently recorded here. It's reported in um, the story. And the story appears both in Kings and Chronicles mm -hmm. and in Isaiah. So this is something God's really highlighting and uh, spotlighting for us. <coughs> it's a major step in redemptive history. Because if Assyria wins, there goes the promise. Judah goes into captivity. Mm -hmm. And God's promise is to preserve it in the house of David. Yeah, there's going to be a captivity sometime, but God has specified Babylon, not Assyria. Mm -hmm. So God, by his own honor, is bound to do something. It doesn't have to be spectacular. But God doesn't decides have to be. doesn't have to be, but hey, when's the last time I did something not so spectacular? Maybe, maybe this is the time. So Hezekiah receives the letter from the messengers, and he goes into the house of the Lord and spreads it out before God. And so he takes a letter, unrolls it, and points and says, Look, see what this guy's saying, Lord? Look at this letter. Read this letter. How often do we treat God like he's one of us? Because we don't have it, it's hard to deal with someone who knows everything from eternity to eternity by one eternal act of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we, 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 we want to talk to him, and he wants to be talked to. Mm -hmm. As uh, it's said of Aslan, sometimes he just likes to be asked. <laughs> so Hezekiah is asking, he's like, look at this, read this. He spreads it before the Lord, and Hezekiah prayed, and this is what he says. O Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, 
God of Israel, that dwelleth between the cherubim, thou art God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. So he doesn't appeal to, but we have been so faithful, or even <laughs> I've been so faithful. Look at all I've done for it. He doesn't go there. He appeals to God's name, his reputation. Of a truth, the Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations in their countries and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. Well, Hezekiah went to the temple, but the answer comes back through Isaiah. Isaiah is told by God, say this, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Wherefore, as thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, this is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? Against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eye on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Notice, God, God could have, and we might expect him to say, all right, you're right about my people. They're wicked, they're corrupt, they deserve punishment, but you touched me, so this is personal just between us now. But he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. He has his people laugh at them. He, has, he inspires his people to mock them, to shake their head, to later on he'll say, to stick out your tongue at them. God includes us in the victory. Mm -hmm. And it's not and it's not just praying for Sennacherib's soul. It's actually laughing him to scorn. Because the things he has said is ridiculous. The position he's put himself in is outrageously dangerous and stupid. And it is worthy of a dark comedy. As you see the guy walking, you know, doing the monologue and, and walking right toward the cliff and then going, ah! it's it's funny. And God Which laughs. Is funny to me too, because the Sennacherib has set himself up as the provider of these people. He says, I'm going to take you where you'll have your own vine and mm -hmm. your own fig tree, and you're going to be taken care of. I'm going to provide for you. He's putting himself in a husbandly role. Yep. Whereas God is saying, oh, that girl that you just tried to seduce. Yeah. Yeah. She's <laughs> laughing at you. And, um, you know, some people have said that if, if a woman – has uh, despised a man in her heart. Like that's the end of a relationship. Like there's yeah. no coming back from that, <laughs> which is why in the New Testament, they're like, wives, reverence your husband. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's how to make this work here. Yeah, that's um, the way it's so it's work. like, this is not working on any level for Sennacherib, according yeah. to God. Yeah. And, and he goes further. And when he identifies himself, he doesn't say the Holy One who made heaven and earth, the Holy One who rules the nations. He says the Holy One of Israel. He's still including his people. You can think back here to um, Balaam, uh, when he's hired by Balak to curse Israel. And Balaam looks out at, at the tribes camped at the foot of Mount Sinai and says something incredible. The Lord hath not seen iniquity in Israel. Mm -hmm. are, are you looking at the same Israel we're looking at? Because, <laughs> you know, the whole Midianite woman thing and the offerings to the dead and before that, the rebellions in the wilderness, the grumbling and the golden gate. <laughs> what do you mean you haven't seen it? Because they're covered by the covenant blood. And so God here says, yeah, yeah, I, I will have things to say to my people later. But right now, this is a family matter and they're my kids and you're not touching them. I'm theirs, they're mine. So uh, you got into something, Sennacherib, you did not understand and um, we're laughing at you. It's too bad for you. By thy servants thou hast reproached the Lord and hast said, By the multitude of my chariots am I come to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and I will cut down the tall cedars thereof, and the choice fir trees thereof, and will enter into the height of his border and the forest of his Carmel. I have digged. What he's doing here is comparing Palestine, Canaan, to uh, Mount Lebanon, which is full of cedars and fir trees. And it has, it's just, the word means, Carmel means garden. It's just, this beautiful place, and he's saying, it's just, we are the Lord's garden, as precious to him as Carmel is to the world. 
And uh, you think you're just going in and chopping down whatever you want, taking whatever you want, dirtying up all the waters. I've digged and drunk the water, and with the soles of my feet have I dried up the rivers of the besieged places. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Hast thou not heard, this is God talking to Sennacherib, hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? And of ancient times that I formed it, now I've brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste defense cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were a small power, they were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass of the on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it be grown up. But I know thy abode. We have a modern equivalent. I know <laughs> I where know you where live. You live. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're part of the plan. You and and, and it was me of, giving you the victories all along. All along, it wasn't that you were beating me? Yeah, and um, you, you, some of this should have leaked out. The prophets had said enough that if mm -hmm. that his spies should have picked up on it and brought back, uh, boss, uh, they think that you're working for their god and that you're accomplishing his purposes. You might want to factor that into how you talk to them. <laughs> and, and, and he got a little in, but not much because he's too proud for that. I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me. Thy rage against me. This was not just political rhetoric. This was not just propaganda. Things they came up with because they thought they would be effective. The king of Assyria actually is angry at Yahweh. Now, we're not told exactly why. We're not told what's going on here that made this happen right now. We are... Um, Trying to remember the sequence for Jonah's preaching. Jerob, Jonah preached during the days of Jeroboam II, which is about in this time period. No, it's past. Because as Hezekiah is ascending the throne, Israel is collapsing in the north. That means Jeroboam's already gone, which means Jonah's already been there. And so it is more than possible that Sennacherib, as a young prince, grew up in a culture that for a brief time had embraced Jehovah. Mm -hmm. And as an unbeliever, maybe that rankled him. I want to go off and do great conquests. Son, that is not the way of the Lord God, creator of heaven of earth. What? That's so not Assyrian. But you understand, we, we, we worship the God of heaven now. So it's your dumb religion that keeps me from going off and making a name for myself and all that. Don't speak of him that way. You need to humble yourself. You know, something like that may have happened. We don't know. <laughs> Or something but, more personal, where yeah, or he was something, blaming yeah. God for something he knew. Who knew he knew God was to blame. Yeah, if, you know, if he had learned that Jehovah is the God of the whole world, so if something got went wrong in his life, he's like, oh, I know who to blame for this. I know who to blame, and he is angry because thy rage against me and thy tumult has come up into my ears. Therefore, I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips. And I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. And this shall be the sign unto thee, that is to Hezekiah and to Judah. Ye shall eat this year such as groweth of itself, and the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof. Almost sounds like the provisions for the Sabbath, the 49th Sabbath year, followed by mm -hmm. the Jubilee. Yeah. You're you're going to live off what was, and then you're going to plant, and you're still going to be living off the harvest, and then it, you're going to actually get busy going back to the way things were. So I was wondering if that was not only like that, but that it exact thing was. of look back at what I already told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it would be – there's there's more to to think about here that I have not considered yet. And the remnant that's escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Last time we heard that phrase, it was with the establishing of Messiah's reign. Mm -hmm. the, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and it ends. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will perform this. Well, this is part of that. Because all of this is about bringing Messiah into the world. This is not... Because God values the nation state of, of Judah for any particular purpose of their own or value of their own or anything they've done. It's all about this is the channel through which Messiah comes. And so a lot of things can go wrong. And we're going to say, I mean, the nation's going to go into captivity before we're done. But not yet, not now. It's not time. God has the pattern set up exactly the right way, and this isn't it. So Assyria needs to go down. 
Thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. This is about the Davidic covenant. It's not because God values Jewish people for being Jewish people. It's all about Messiah. If they will trust in their Messiah, then God will use them and God will bless them. But he doesn't need anybody. He just has provided certain channels that he's planning to use. And so he's going to defend those channels until he's ready to dispose of them. Well, that's the end of the message, but not the end of what God does. And God is so succinct about what he does. The angel of the Lord, that would be Jesus, went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand, a hundred and eighty-five thousand in the army. And when they arose in the, mer in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. That is when the remaining people woke up, obviously, the dead people <laughs> didn't get up. <laughs> they didn't wake up dead. <laughs> oh, look, we're all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. The um, Egyptians preserve some record of their supposed confrontation with the Assyrians and took complete credit for it. But since I don't remember <laughs> the details, details precisely, I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, so history does know about this kind of. They know that Assyria was there, that the Egyptians were coming, that there was at least some kind of um, preparatory confrontation, and that the, Assyri the Assyrians turned around and ran. The Egyptians attribute it to their gods. Um, the Assyrians are strangely silent in their uh, inscriptions. We have Sennacherib saying, yeah, I shut up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage, but no mention of what happened afterward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, you know, radio silence. We're not talking about that right now. And sometime thereafter, within a fairly short time, it seems, it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch his god, that Adramelech and Sharezer his son smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Ezra Haddon, his son, reigned in his stead. Armenia, uh, that's what we call it. Uh, at that time, it was called Duratu, and Assyrians know all about it. It was a major power to the north, and if you listen to the consonants, Uratu, Urat. Ararat. This is Mount. This mm. is a kingdom centered on Mount Ararat. They were a very powerful kingdom to the north. They had been a thorn in the side of Assyria. There had been a lot of conflict, and it sounds. And since his sons, upon killing him, escaped there, it sounds like they probably had bought off his sons. They were probably the two sons not in line, and probably Uratu had made a deal with them and said, "You get rid of your dad, and then you come home to us, and we'll embrace you and." Make you your life's wonderful. Anyway, that's what happened. They they ran. They killed their dad. They assassinated him while he was worshiping, and they run away, leaving Esarhaddon in charge of Assyria. And then he has a lot of work to do. And Judah is simply not one of his major concerns. And so Judah gets a pass for a while. Assyria goes on, and and we'll see uh, probably next time. I'm guessing that uh, one of the things that happens in here is this little place called Babylon keeps rebelling. Mm -hmm. And eventually, the Bab one of the Babylonian kings says, enough of that, and just smashes and wipes it out. Ezra Haddon, aside from conquering Egypt, also looks out there and says, but, you know, that's a great trading location. We really should have something there. I know, let's rebuild Babylon. <laughs> and we'll put these uh, these Chaldean folk in there, and, and they can be our people. And, and yeah, won't that be great? That's one of the worst mistakes in the history of <laughs> geopolitical science. Um, but we'll see more of what goes on with all of that. So, but, but God not only substantially reduces the size of the Assyrian army and arranges for the current king and conqueror to die at the hands of his son, um, he, he re-diverts all the Assyrian strategy and energy and military efforts in other directions so that Assyria no longer is a threat to Judah. In fact, Judah has rather a free hand for the next couple generations. Um, uh, Manasseh, Hezekiah's son, will kind of play footsie again with the Assyrians and get in trouble with them as a result. 
but um, there, there's no immediate threat to Jerusalem until Babylon comes along. So God fulfills his promise. He takes care of his people. Uh, this is one of those one of those rare times in history where God says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes God wins with little minor things. You know, someone can't sleep and calls for the chronicles. <laughs> um, sometimes through raising up some great man, Judas Maccabeus, David the son of Jesse, uh, who changes the course of history. Um, sometimes it's through the slow development of technology, the development of, you know, stirrups or um, an atomic bomb or whatever. Or printing press. Printing press. Or sometimes through God's control of nature, an untimely storm, a bank of fog. But then sometimes in the history of the world, God has intervened. And it's impressive. And sometimes we, we tend to think, well, that's how God works. Well, that's how God has worked a few times. There was this flood that destroyed the world. There was the Tower of Babel. There was this complete destruction of Egypt by 10 plagues. There was the sun standing still in the sky. And there was this. God can and does interrupt his normal, faithful, covenantal providence and do things that by our standards are absolutely spectacular. But that's kind of because we're jaded. We don't think of God making the sun rise every day as all that big a deal because we're so <laughs> used to it. It doesn't take any more for God to stop the sun than for him to make the sun go up. But one we're used to and the other we're not. And the God who daily calls to judgment millions of souls around the world, i.e., God kills people every day in the millions. Here he kills 100,000. We go, whoa, wow, what a God. Yeah, well, yes, but consider. We are too easily impressed by the spectacular, but at the same time, we should certainly be thankful for it when God does do cool, nifty things that yeah, help well, our weak it's, faith. It's not so much that we're, we shouldn't be impressed by what we would call miracles. It's that we should be impressed every single yes. day with the ordinary <laughs> <Exactly>. stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The miracles remind us that God, that God is control. I was uh, acquainted with a uh, educational movement in Christian circles mm -hmm. that like to talk about the providence of God. The problem was none of these people were Calvinists. And so they actually had no idea what providence actually meant. I asked the two of the sons of one of the leaders of the movement, oh, you, you keep talking about providence, what is providence? And what they came up with is it means that sometimes God steps into history and does really nifty things that are wow and unusual, and then he steps back out. That's he not the biblical doctrine of providence. Hmm? I, I, he steps back out? I just can't. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is like, like deism with a pause button. Um, yeah, that's a, God sets up the natural laws that run the universe, and occasionally he interrupts them to do something nifty, and that's providence. Now, I don't know that all the leaders of this movement would have said that, but these are the sons of one of the leaders, and they both said the same thing, and they had no idea that what they were saying was was wholly unbiblical and, um, and such. Out of curiosity, do you know if there was overlap between this movement and the movement that claimed that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were inspired by God? I did not know there was a movement outside Mormonism that did that. Oh. So you oh, apparently yeah, are familiar with something I'm not familiar with. But did they place a high standing on those documents? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the movement began when a couple of nice older ladies, ladies discovered the uh, the sterling character of Americans' founders and wanted to find out what things, what principles they adhered to that allowed them to set this nation on its course. And so having discovered these, they then went back to the Bible and tried to find the biblical source for these things. This is, and, and I, I asked the, the gentleman I've talked about as one of their leaders, I asked him point blank, the, nicely, but I said, you know, is this what, this is, I'm, am I describing this accurately? He said, oh yeah, yeah, that's it. So you came up with the principles, then you tried to find them in the Bible. How is this mm -hmm. not blatant humanism? <laughs> But <laughs> it's kind of like the, the mindset that says, well, this is from before 1850 and all that terrible modernism. Yeah. So it must be good. <laughs> yeah. Like the McGuffey's readers. Yeah. Or leave it to Beaver. Because, <laughs> you know, that was before 1963. So 
So it was before everything in the world went wrong. Yeah. It's so untouched the, 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 by, yeah. unsoiled by modernity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, the point being that God has a plan. God is in control. God executes his plan day by day, moment by moment. He makes the grass grow. He makes the sun shine. He makes our hearts beat. And he overthrows the wicked on his schedule. And he calls people to faith in his son by his divine power. Does that mean, well, then we're puppets and we don't have anything to do. I don't know about you, but I have a lot to do. <laughs> God works for human beings and we have stuff, we have we have tasks. Hezekiah kind of went through the ringer on this and yet ultimately, what did he do? Prayed. Mm -hmm. He didn't fight any battles. He didn't draw a sword. He didn't even actually personally get up on the wall and say, na 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 na, <laughs> um, go away or we will taunt you again. And in none of that, he just trusted God with the faith God gave him, prayed, and stood back and God did it all. Because ultimately, that's the nature of salvation. And perhaps that's why God puts it in the Bible three times. Mm -hmm. Here was a time when Jerusalem and Judah desperately needed salvation, when the Messianic, Messianic line that ran through Hezekiah's loins needed to be spared so the world could be saved. God was the salvation. He didn't trust it in anybody else. Uh, this whole section that we've been passing through, as we go through Isaiah, we're, we're seeing as the backdrop Assyria and then later Babylon. These are nations that clamored for a new world order that they would bring about. Based on con the idea of continuity of being, all reality is one and it's concentrated in the hands of the state and thus it is the state's job to establish perfect unity among all the peoples of the world. But as one character says in Star Trek episode, yeah, but I got to be the unity. <laughs> and so each one comes to the stage of history wanting to be the unity in this noble project of reuniting humanity as they tried at Babel. And you know what? We still face it today. Mm -hmm. And we still have Christians who look at this and tremble, are terrified, and either say, well, all it means is that the rapture is coming really soon, or, well, the bad guys are going to win, but we're going to go down trying to get people to believe us, although it's absolutely futile. I don't want to belong to either of those camps, thank you. I'd rather believe what the Bible says, that God is our Savior, and that he works salvation in the earth, and that he's got us covered. We may not see, I mean, Hezekiah, the last thing Hezekiah probably had in his list of possibilities for the next morning was, angel of the Lord comes and kills 180,000 people. That I bet that wasn't on his possible itinerary list. That was just something <laughs> God did out of nowhere. And sometimes God does things out of nowhere. And sometimes, as I said, it's some king can't sleep and calls for the royal records, or someone invents movable invents movable type, or someone discovers a verse, the just shall live by faith. Or someone sails the wrong way and discovers the world's bigger than he thought, and oh, look, there's America. Uh, <laughs> God has all kinds of ways. And when we try to pin God down to, well, if I was God, I would do it this way, we are already idiots. <laughs> and we need to have a greater faith that says, God's got a plan. I don't need to know what it is. I don't have to be able to tell you how God's going to turn all this around, how long it will take or what it will look like, or how much we will suffer and be persecuted along the way. But I know that God is good. And so if there is a lesson, I suppose that's one of the main ones in all of this mm -hmm. um, story. Cool. Well, that's a good place to wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any recommendations? I do. It comes from... Um, something my wife was dealing with earlier today. Uh, I recommend, and I think I've done it before, teaching your children the whole Bible <laughs> in order. I think we come passage, back to this one periodically. Verse by verse. Yeah, we do. <laughs> because again and again, I am reminded how many parents and how many churches and Sunday school programs and even Christian school programs don't do this. This is, this is time to to stop and think. First of all, dear dear listener, have you read the Bible all the way through, cover mm -hmm. to cover, in order? Either the order it appears in or chronological order, which can also be very useful. Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, the question is why not? If the answer to that is, well, I have other things to do, let me suggest that you don't, <laughs> right. that you have your priorities wrong. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to know God, you have to know him in the context of what he's written. You get a love letter from your from your best beloved. You don't pick some of the sentences near the end and the close off and say, I've read the letter, all that other stuff. Eh, I know the kind of stuff he says or she says. I don't need to read that. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. How about when your great grandfather is dying? And there's some mention up there, something about money and will. But you, you, you'd rather read it, the last few jokes he included at the end because that seems more relevant <laughs> right now. What when we don't treat any other important document that way? Someone hands you a contract to sign. You don't just read the last third of it. Mm-hmm. You want to know what are the conditions that set up the last third, so I know what I'm actually dealing with. If you're serious about knowing God, you need to read the whole Bible. Now, having once you've done it, you can then turn to your spouse, to your children, and say, I challenge you, read the Bible. Begin at the beginning. Let's make it a family thing. Let's challenge each other. Let's have a contest. Let's let's say every night at dinner time, we're going to talk about what we read. And we're going to talk about, and this is what my, my wife was kind of dealing with today. So we're going to talk, we're, we're going to be in uh, the beginning of the Bible, and we're going to talk about... Um, Let's see, rape and incest and mass murder and war and destroying all life on the planet. And, you know, it just goes like that for a while. <laughs> um, Such a sweet, wholesome book. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And then there's the and there's the whole Tamar story and mm-hmm. um, Lot's daughters and Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> yeah, homosexuality, and fire, people, God burning people up with fire from heaven. It's in the Bible. Do you know where? Do you know why? Do you know where? how it's part of the storyline and why it's important? How about circumcision? Talk to your kids about that one yet? <laughs> God put it there, and God ordered Israel that when they came together at the, uh, the Sabbath here, a Feast of Tabernacles, they were to read it out loud to everyone, including the women and children. That's a great privilege. <laughs> what, if you, what if you went to uh, church this, this Sunday, this Lord's Day, and the pastor said, well, you know, the Bible says some hard and difficult things, and we do. We no longer want to offer, uh, offend the ears of the the young and the innocent and the uh, uh, those of a sensitive nature. So, when we read anything of that sort, we're going to ask the women and children to leave the auditorium out of love and kindness and appreciation for their delicate nature. Emily, how would that go over with you? Mm, it wouldn't, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I just, you know, all the cultures throughout history who have consistently denied education to women, it, it sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> Except this is worse. It's not just education. It's specifically the knowledge of God. Yeah. As he's revealed himself. The, you can the know education the good and sweet that counts, thi- in other yeah, words. <laughs> you could know the good and sweet things about God, but there's other stuff about God. You're oh, not, you're not you can't to. handle the truth. <laughs> so we'll protect you from it. We'll protect you from God and from his word. Uh, mm. So read the whole Bible. Get your spouse to read it. Get your children to read it. Make it a priority. If we're going to see revival in this country, it's not going to come because we all went to some um, conference and got up and jumped around and spread our hands to heaven and play really cool music. It's going to become, it's going to come because we get serious about knowing God. Mm-hmm. And he's given us this love letter called the Bible. We need to read it, all of it. What's mm-hmm. your recommendation? <laughs> what, you expect me to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> um, my recommendation is staying consistent with a Bible reading plan because Ooh. I have not done that. And so per usual, in September, I am catching up on May's readings. <laughs> mm. um, so I I just finished Second Kings. Um, the plan that I am using this year has Old Testament and New Testament readings for each day. Uh-huh. And as I'm catching up, I'm sort of chunking the Old Testament. So like I'll read the whole um, book in the Old Testament, and then I'll go and read the whole book in the New Testament ah. and sort of switch back and forth. I can't I, imagine why you why why you're so far behind. I mean, it's you're home <laughs> now and you have the a baby. So what what could possibly be eating your time up? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> read They're it out all loud. Excuses. To, read it out loud to Gretchen so she gets to hear it while she's yeah. still little. Yeah. Okay. That's yes. Have a Bible. So do you have a Bible plan you're rec- you're recommending then? Um. Well, or the one that I. One? Just find one. Yeah, I the one that I'm using, I am using because it's printed in the back of my Bible. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, like I have I've used other plans. I I really like the one that's like not a daily breakdown, but in this month read these ah, books. Uh-huh. Um cuz you know, every day you find different lengths of time that you're right, able to read. Right. Um so I I prefer that sort of long 
long chunks of assignment rather than yeah. during the summer i regularly found myself going beyond my normal two chapters a day reading mm -hmm. three or four or five now that school started and i, I read in the morning uh, I'm staying with two is sometimes challenging but it's, it's been okay mm -hmm. but i have started a new practice when i finish reading a chapter i read two or three verses into the next chapter Mm, Just in case some, there's some major heading. connection <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that the chapter division is obscuring and that I've never caught before. Because there are some mm -hmm. places like that where mm -hmm. if you would go back and look at the verse that came in the previous chapter, this would make a lot more sense. Yeah. So, and that's, a, that. as I'm catching up, that is why I prefer reading the whole book mm -hmm. at, as fast as I can. Yeah. Because um, you I just, I'm the sort of person who can't really keep current with television because between one week and the next, I forget what happened and I don't really care anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to watch shows that have already been released. Yes. So you can um, watch so them all very quickly. I like binging, I think we call it. Binging. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I prefer to think of it as uh, keeping the whole arc in view. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, very good. Yeah. So that, I'll recommend that. Okay. I feel like that's, that's a, good, a, that's a suitable follow-up for yours, yes. if anything is. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Oh, Thank you uh, so much. We should say something about Brian. <laughs> oh, yeah, we miss Brian. Um, he wasn't able to make it tonight. Um, but I'm, I'm sure by now the listeners know that's kind of how it goes around here. <laughs> We've all got <laughs> stuff going on. Yeah, um, I, I sometimes are just afraid if, if we don't mention that someone's gone. It's like... <gasps> Has there been some kind of schism amongst the, the people here? No, fine. Yeah, if that happens, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> some, some suitable, polite way. Yeah. But it's not going to happen, Lord willing. Lord willing. Uh, it's our job to try to not, not, not let, that, let happen. that happen. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for this conversation. It's always great to especially go through these historical bits that get... They don't make it into the Jesus storybooks. Oh, uh, yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of reasons to read the Bible. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thank you very much to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, there are a couple of ways you can support us if you would like. You can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or you can visit our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much. See you next time.